Well, Dan. Hello. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. You're leading into yet another main event against the Korean zombie in a fight you've been calling for for a yeah. long time. But, you know, your family's grown. Yeah. You and wife Savannah welcome baby Bam. Yeah. What's fatherhood been like for you? It's been awesome, to be honest. I mean, this everything just happened so fast from my last fight to the pregnancy to the birth to getting another main event fight. It just all happened so fast. And here we are now. Bam's six weeks old and... It's just been a blast. Every single day has been something new. Just being able to like come home from training and hold him and look at him and he looks back at you. And it's like, honestly, the best thing. I feel like it's completed my life. Like it's made everything really like kind of make sense in my life. And I, I think it's going to make me a better human being, a better husband, a better fighter. And um, yeah, honestly, I'm just super happy and I, I can't complain. I'm grateful. I can tell how much you and Savannah love being par parents, but is it difficult to have a newborn while you're doing fight camp? Uh, it's super difficult. <laughs> I mean, I knew it when the day Sean Shelby called me about the main event. He said, we have the you know, main event June, June 19th. And I was like, man, my son's due literally any day now. He's like, I was like, I don't know what my life's gonna be like. He's like, it's gonna suck. <laughs> like, it's gonna be hard. <laughs> And I knew it going into it, and I talked to Savannah, and I said it's a great opportunity. My goal is to become a champion, and opportunities like this to go ahead and face a legend like the Korean Zombie and fight number four in the world to establish myself in that top five. Like these opportunities don't come every day, and I feel like like I'm a man of opportunity. And I I I feel like you know it was calling me, and I. I and I, I know things are were, are going to be hard, obviously, with, with having a newborn son. And, like, I, I invite that tough life, I guess. But it, it's not. It, it, it's great, you know, coming home. Of course, yeah, we get a little less sleep, but I have my mom in town. Savannah's helping out. And they understand my sleep and my recovery and everything is a priority going into this fight. Obviously, I got to make up for it a little bit after the <laughs> fight. But, um, yeah, so far so good. And it, it's just been great. What's your favorite part of being a dad? Um, honestly, just holding him and like talking to him. Like I talk to him like a normal human being and like trying to get reactions out of him. Like obviously he's not talking back to me yet, but he makes facial expressions. Like he knows I'm dad. Um, there was a day like Savannah had him all day and he was crying all day and she couldn't do anything. And I finally came home from training. I just grabbed him and he stopped crying cause he just wanted dad and like, for me, that's awesome. Just like kind of being wanted, like he wants me, he wants his dad. And I think that's really cool. It has to be super motivating too, right? Like on the hard days of training or when maybe you don't want to get up and go to the gym, looking at him has to provide some sort of amplification to how you feel inside, right? Yeah, no, I'd say I'm the most motivated I've ever been. And I know it's a kind of a cliche thing. Like, yeah, I got a kid, like now everything has a purpose. Like it's always had a purpose for me. I've it's just amplified and like I've always thought I was a professional but now I truly feel like I'm a professional and I'm not trying to use my kid as an excuse but he's really um he's become that balance for me and like he puts structure into my life it, even though it's crazy and chaos like it it created a structure in my life and in my training and everything's just going perfectly as planned I love that. Yeah. And I love the history of you and Savannah. You guys have been together. You were best friends, but were you dating in high school? Yeah, no, we, we were just friends in high school. And I think when I went to college, we kind of like realized some what we had was probably special. And then we were like texting and sending each other Facebook videos, like little private Facebook videos every day and just posting on each other's wall. And then when I came back from college, uh, we kind of started dating and I think we, we dated for like five, six years before we got married. But yeah, it's been a crazy, I've known her since she was 12 years old, 12 years old, so. You know, I'm gonna have to bring this up and it's it's a wonderful throwback photo that your wife Savannah posted <laughs> of you guys in high school. And um, you look a little different. Just a little. You guys look young and in love, but um, maybe not the Danny Gay we're used to seeing. Tell me <laughs> a little bit about that time in your life. Uh, I don't know, it's probably just a you know, goofy, fat, skater kid. Um, yeah, when everyone looks at this photo, just know that's the kid you're getting beat up by. So, uh, 
Um, I don't know. It's just good times, man. I, I had a weird style. And I guess just that's how we are. You know, we just grow as humans. I'm I'm the same kid inside, and just with a with a gold belt around my waist. I don't know. Exactly. Were you a big skater? I mean, you, you mentioned it a couple of times. Like, how much time and effort was put into, like, skating and surfing in your life? Um, yeah, honestly, that was my first, my first ever dream or goal, like, was to become a professional skateboarder. Like, even as a kid, I visualized myself being in a video game, not EA Sports, EOC, but I picture myself <laughs> being in Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Like, I was going to be in a video game. Um, yeah, we made it in one, just not <laughs> Tony Hawk Pro Skater. <laughs> Listen, it's still very cool to be in a video game. Yeah. Do you still skate now? I do from time to time. It just hurts a lot more. <laughs> Can we maybe talk to Tony Hawk's video game about, like, celebrity guest appearances, like celebrities who skate? Maybe we'll th yeah. we can get you on there. Yeah, for for real. I mean, I I I love the skateboarding community, the surf community. I grew you know, growing up in Hawaii, it's a big surf community, and that's, like, if you were to put me in a category, like I want to be in the surf category, like I don't want to be in the fighter category. I'm a fa fighter, but like I'm like a surfer, skater, chill kid that, you know, happens to fight. You're an onion, all yeah. your different layers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything from your skating and surfing background that you utilize in your fight life? I'd say so. Yeah, most definitely. From skating, just like, just the reflexes, like, I'm a street skater, so like I grew up like skating with on the streets with cars, and like you just have to be aware and like just know what's going on around you. So that's definitely helped me as far as like seeing things and controlling the distance and controlling the octagon. Like that actually helped. It's helped me. Being a skater has helped me as a fighter, and then surfing too. Like I'm going against Mother Nature. There's I'm not going against. I'm going going against another human being here, but Mother Nature is a whole different animal. So you can't you don't beat mother nature so uh yeah just being able to stay calm in scary situations when the waves are big or like you it's easy like people drown all the time or people like fall on a wave or hit their head like it's just things happen out of your beyond your control and it's staying calm in those scary scary situations that um definitely has translated over into fighting um yeah just being calm in the moment and being being aware did you ever have any scary situations in either of those skating or surfing yeah um i have i unfortunately it's not good for the sport but i hit my head a lot skating like i fall and like you know her roll an ankle bust your elbow like i've gone a ton of injuries skating and then surfing too i've had scary situations where i've almost drowned and yeah yeah, it's not it's not fun. So we lighten up on those now that you're a professional fighter, right? Like yeah. we're just we're very safe. When yeah, skating. Okay. yeah, just a little. <laughs> That's what I thought. Cool. That makes me feel better. Yeah. <laughs> How would she have described you back then? Uh, probably a goofy, goofy skater kid with a big backpack and big feet. <laughs> <laughs> but you were also a wrestler. Yeah, I started wrestling my junior year. So, so. that's pretty late. Yeah. Um, what was that experience like and what kind of drew you to it? Um, I don't, I don't really know. My dad wrestled in high school, but my dad never pushed me to wrestle or do anything. Um, I kind of just, my friend, like Puna Soriano, UFC fighter, he was actually wrestling before me and he kind of got me to come into the wrestling room one day and I was like naturally okay, like decent at wrestling. I, but I was doing jujitsu beforehand. Um, so I wasn't good because I like being on my back and I would get pinned, but <laughs> Fair it, enough. Yeah. How long have you known Puna? Um, I knew Puna just as long as I knew Savannah. Probably we went to high school together. Um, I've known Puna probably since eighth grade. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What's it like to know now you're both in the UFC? You know, competing at the highest level in the world. It's pretty awesome. Honestly, we we used to talk about it and kind of joke about it. Never like really seriously thought we would ever make it, but we talk about like being fighters and I don't know it just all kind of came together um, when I after wrestling in high school I went and wrestled in Iowa for two years and I invited Puna and Puna came out and wrestled there for four years and uh, after his wrestling season like I was already training MMA and I got him into MMA like come do an MMA practice so like he got me into wrestling 
and I got him into MMA and we kind of like followed each other's footsteps. I came out here to Vegas. He came out here to Vegas and um, yeah, here we are now. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What was your first experience like realizing maybe fighting something you wanted to do? Um, I think it was after my first fight. So Savannah, her brothers are, were actually MMA fighters way before I started fighting. And maybe that was like part of my like reason to get her <laughs> like, okay, I got to impress her. I got to be a fighter. <laughs> um, but yeah, I took my first amateur fight and I won and within a minute, I just, it was a feeling I got that I've never, I never got from winning any wrestling match, any jujitsu match. And it was just like, I knew at that very second when I won my first amateur fight, it was something I wanted to do. So, uh, and I went on a pretty long, extensive amateur streak. I did, like, I think I had 11 amateur fights. Wow. Yeah, in Hawaii. And then you can consider them almost pro fights in Hawaii because just people know how to fight. And, yeah. Uh, I had zero stand-up, and everyone's a good stand-up fighter there, good kickboxer, good boxers. Um, but, yeah, it just kind of it kept growing on me, growing on me, and eventually I made a decision to go pro and move my life to Vegas, and everything seems to have worked out. <laughs> I want to, before we get into moving to Vegas, I want to go back. I mean, taking an amateur fight is still a big decision, right? Yeah. Um, did you grow up watching fights? Was it just something, I mean, did you get into fights? I mean, how yeah. did you decide to take that leap? Um, I did, I did grow up. I was watching, obviously, I was watching the UFC. BJ Penn was a champion at the time. Frankie Edgar, Matt Hughes, all these guys, like the, the OGs of the sport. So I was watching them, Randy Couture. Um, and I was always a fan of it. Uh, and I just, I knew it was something I probably wanted to do. And I, I felt like I had to, I came to a point in my life, I had to make a decision, like, what am I going to do? I'm going to join the military or am I going to be a surfer or skater? Like, it's kind of the things I liked, but I liked fighting too. So I kind of, when I started getting in, into training full time, I, I was good at it. I felt like I was pretty good at, like, natural at it. So I just kept training and I made those sacrifices in the beginning. And there was a time in my life, like, no one believed in me except for myself. Savannah believed in me. She was with me from my first amateur, f yeah, my first amateur fight. Wow. So I kind of had to like tell everyone like, I'm going to do it. Like, it's just going to take time. And it took a long time. I had my amateur career was took about three years. And then from, from the time I turned pro in 2014, it just, yeah, it was a, it was a long road and a lot of a lot of halts in the road, a lot of fights that fell through that should have happened that fell through, and I just I always knew I would get to the UFC somehow, some way. It was just a matter of time, and um, it was just hard because I didn't know when. I couldn't tell people when it was going to happen, and yeah, just those little sacrifices and every everything paid off to get to where I'm now. You move from Hawaii to Las Vegas and you find a home at Extreme Couture. And, you know, if you walk into that gym, you're probably going to see a couple of Hawaiians on the mat between, you know, yourself and Brad Tavares and Puna, like you talked about. And Eric Nixick is one of the head coaches over there. He's been in your corner for so many of your fights. And it seemed to just be the right mixture. Um, and now people are, are kind of seeing what Extreme Couture has, what Eric has as a coach. For you, what is so special about the formula over there? Honestly, I, when I, the, from my very first day when I walked into Extreme Couture, like it just felt, it felt like my my home. And um, leaving Hawaii was hard for me, but like when I came to Extreme Couture, it just I felt like I was still in Hawaii. You know, I have a bunch of Hawaiians in the gym around me. And like it just felt like that atmosphere. I felt the mana. I felt the the Ohana there, my, my family. So I, I fit in from day one. Like it was just like, I knew it was a place th that was meant for me. And yeah, I guess from day one, I didn't really have a coach when I walked in that gym. Like I kind of, I was a floater. Like I, I came, I showed up to every practice. Like I, I didn't want to go there and start demanding like, Hey, you're going to, I'm going to work with you. I'm going to work with you. I just kind of went there, kept my mouth shut, worked hard, went home and showed up every day. And I met Eric, and he uh, he started cornering me. Probably m my second fight after becoming a XC athlete, um, and we just created a. I, I feel like the bond, like I, I just had a great bond with him, great synergy, and 
it just it's been growing every fight and I, I feel like Eric because he's he was newer and like he came from a different background from more of a football like he had a different eye towards the sport where he can really like I don't know he's a motivator he's like myself like that's why we feed off each other like well I'll find the one comment in the comment section that says like you can't like do it and like I that'll, that'll fire me up and same with Eric like if one person says anything like negative like it just fires him up to be a better coach and or if someone has one little mistake or bad performance in a fight and then on Monday like everyone's going to pay for it and everyone's going to remember that so I, I think that's super important as a fighter and as a coach like just having that bond and having that synergy and we're hungry like we have an underdog mentality and we just kind of we we fire each other up like with if he's feeling down like I'll lift him up if I'm feeling down he'll lift me up and we just make each other better and I think that's really important for any fighter to have with their coach is just have that bond have that synergy so I, I think that's something special that I have with Eric and yeah big titles big things coming on the way what's it like for you who's been a long time extreme couture athlete to see the gym and the coaching staff start to get the recognition that we used to know about extreme couture years yeah. and years and years ago but now it's kind of evolved there's there's a new set of faces in there you've got champion francis and ganu who's training out of extreme couture aljamain sterling who spent a lot of time in extreme couture in the lead up to his title fight i mean for you there's got to be some satisfaction that the people you've always believed in are yeah. now getting that recognition most definitely i i think extreme couture in the past had more of a bad rep like that was a gym where people would just show up to fight and like we don't train smart and we're super and we just go out there to bang and this and that and I think it over time it's evolved like we don't even put big gloves on anymore we, we've gotten a lot more technical over these you know in the past years like we, we've just evolved and like you have to evolve in the sport because if you don't like you're just gonna get you know rushed away in the wind and I, I think that's key is just to keep evolving, you know, as the sport grows, like the sport is still so young, you know, 25, 26, like 30, I don't even know, but it's so young and you have to constantly evolve. Um, and that's what we do as humans, as human beings, like we're creatures of habit, like, so we want to do like the easy stuff, but like, I think something that separates extreme couture is just we're, we're constantly changing and adapting and growing and everyone, it's just been great. It's been on fire. So many guys in there. Everyone's hungry. Everyone sees each other succeeding. So it makes everyone better. And it's contagious. Yeah. What was your dad's influence in the fighting career, if, if there was any? Yeah, he, like I said, he never really pushed me to do anything. He, my dad was always supportive of, supportive of what I wanted to do. Um, obviously, he loves fighting and it's probably something he would have done if he didn't join the military. Um, but he's always been that cool, cool dad, like take me skating, take me surfing, just let, he let me do what I wanted to do, never push me into anything. That's kind of like how I want to like be with Bam too and just kind of be free, like give him, give him options and give him routes, but I don't want to like be so strict on him and push him into something. And, but yeah, my dad's always been super supportive and um, I think he's just been a big help to me overall just mentality and you know coming from a navy seal background like he's he, he wasn't like the super serious guy but at the end of the day he was like he had this mentality that was super stern and poised and calm and collected and i think that carried on with me into my fighting style yeah i i want to talk about that i mean the navy seal background he's such a prestigious member of our armed forces and he's you know served this country so yeah. greatly how did he just inspire you in general in life? From honestly, from when I was five years old, six years old, like he would take me to work with him. Um, and we go through buds training, which was like Navy SEAL training. Yeah. And it, it was intense. And I was just a kid and I got to like go to work with him and watch him like here's grown men on the beach, like rolling around in the in the sand and jumping in the water and then running miles and then but for me, it was fun to watch. And like he would like even tell me to like tell them to do stuff like sing, sing Daniel's song, sing, like, tell me a joke. And like, here's the five-year-old kid rousing a 18-year-old, 20-year-old grown man. And I, I didn't know it at the time, but 
it, it did instill a mentality of work ethic and just mental toughness and I don't know, I don't know. Well, his, I'm sure his influence is what led to your success, you know, in whatever you wanted to do, but it became mixed martial arts. And yeah. July 25th, 2017, it seems like that's when the tide really changed when you appeared on the Contender Series. Yeah. What do you remember from that time? I mean, it took place just a couple of miles from here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Contender Series was, um, it was a great opportunity for me. And I was actually, the fight before that was coming off, it was, I fought on Dana White's Looking for a Fighter, I fought on one of the shows out there, and had a great performance, and I beat the guy uh, by decision. But it was like 30-25 across the board, and I demolished him. And I was like, okay, I'm, maybe I'll get a contract tonight, and I didn't. And then I got the opportunity to fight on the Contender Series, and I was like, okay, this is it. This is finally my opportunity. And I went out there, and I, I believe I put on one of the best performances of the season, and I showed everything that you can in a MMA fight. I showed my striking, I showed my durability, my scramble ability, my wrestling, my jiu-jitsu, literally everything in a fight, my cardio conditioning, and, and I finished the guy in the third round. And it was a tough, super tough prospect, Luis Gomez. He was an up-and-comer mm -hmm. Cuban kid was doing backflips like, before we are about to fight. And I was like, okay, I, <laughs> I don't know. But anyways, I beat him, finished him. Then I was sitting there after, after the when Dana was pick, going through picking all the fighters, and I was like, okay, for sure I'm going to get picked. Like, I, I was ready to cry. I was like, I knew, I knew it was going to happen. I was like, waiting to get picked to cry. Like, I was just waiting. I was like, it's going to happen. And then everyone gets called, and I was still sitting here in my chair and didn't, didn't get picked. And I was like, what kind of sucked, you know? I didn't know why, and I went back and whatever, cried about it for a little bit. But I won at the end of the day, and it wasn't going to stop me from, like, giving up on it. I was like, okay, I'm just going to go back and get another fight. And then eventually they ended up... Uh, you know, calling me for an opportunity to fight in the UFC. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, from Contender Series, did you feel like, were you bitter at all? I mean, what was the emotion after that? Like you said, you won, you showed yeah. so many skills, but you didn't get the contract that night. Yeah, no, I, I was bitter, and I kind of had a, even to today, like, have a chip on my shoulder from that, even though I've proven myself now and, you know, showed, obviously, I belong here. But I, I kind of carried that chip on my shoulder and had that, I had a little grudge against Dana for a while, like, what, what was it in, that you didn't like, you know, in my performance? Was it just the way I carried myself? Was it the showman, like, maybe I didn't jump on the cage and yell or have this crazy amount of energy? But I don't know. I think about that a lot, and I, I kind of carried that with me going into all my UFC fights. Um, even though I fell short in my debut, I, I still, like, carried that chip on my shoulder and came back and went on a tear. And... Uh, I carry that chip on my shoulder to this day and you know I'm gonna carry all the way till I'm a champion and I, I just want to be the guy that get that didn't get picked on the contender series that became a champion yeah you want to be yeah. like Tom Brady be yeah. drafted so late exactly. in the rounds but here you are being the goat no I totally yeah. understand yeah. that so Dan you mentioned this chip on your shoulder and understandable but then you main event a card in Abu Dhabi and you become the first Contender Series alum to have a main event. What was that like for you? I mean, what kind of reaction emotionally did it instill in you? I didn't really put too much emphasis on it because of that little chip on my shoulder. I just, honestly, like it just made me more fired up. Like every time I see Dana White's, um, if you don't know, now you know videos, like, and you see my name there, it says CS next to it, Contender Series, and I'm like, don't claim me. I'm not, <laughs> you didn't pick me. Don't claim me. I, I don't know. It just gives me fuel, gives me motivation, and, but the goal is to be the first guy from the Contender Series to become a champion, and I think that's what matters. The main event's cool. The second main event's cool. The championship is what matters. What kind of inspiration do you feel like you give other fighters by that example? Okay, hey, I didn't get picked, and maybe they don't get picked for the Ultimate Fighter or Contender Series, or they don't get signed when they think they should. Yeah. But if they look at you, what a what a beautiful example. Yeah, I mean, it literally, it's just don't give up. Like, if you have a goal, just keep going for it. Like, you can't let other people dictate your your dreams or desires. So, and 
I'm not going to let Dana or anyone like make that decision for me. That's my choice. I create my destiny. So uh, that's all I can really say is just keep going, keep, keep on going, keep chipping away and eventually things will pay off. Yeah. Yeah, 50K Ige, I mean, that's a perfect nickname, even yeah. though I, I saw it, maybe you might change it. No, I don't know. <laughs> People are telling me to change it to 70, I just, 75K. I, yeah. I love it. I love it. But yeah, after that experience, you go on a tear. Yeah. And not just a win streak of six fights, but you're also, you were also active um, very often. Yeah. How do you feel like that helped your evolution in this sport? Uh, I just, for me, like, I'm a big guy of momentum. So when I came back, my first fight after after losing my debut, I I beat up Mike Mike Santiago in 47 seconds. I I TKO'd him, and I wanted to keep keep the momentum going. So I got another fight, and then I fought. Um, I went to London. I fought Danny Henry, and I I got the choke. I got the finish. Got the bonus, and then that's where the 50k Ige kind of like <laughs> came into place. And um, after that, just I've, I was like, man, I'm winning. I might as well just keep going. And I never really got out of camp. I just went straight fight after fight after fight after fight. Um, and I, I felt like I had to do that. Like I had to take that the fast track. And because the momentum was so strong. So it, it was good and bad. It was good in the sense that like I rode the momentum. I went on this streak. You know, I established a name for myself. But it was bad in the sense that I never really got to like truly grow. Um, I did because people say you don't get better in camps and right. I, I believe I was getting better because I was fighting I was gaining experience I was getting ring time and so I was getting better in that sense but I wasn't getting in the better like a technicality since I never really had time to like sit and work on techniques or like have a boxing coach or anything like that and I just kind of went with the flow and went with my athleticism and used my cardio and and it worked for six fights till um, till we reached Calvin, and then then we lost another you know decision, but it's okay. What did you take from that experience against Calvin? Um, I if anything, I just got confidence out of it. I got confidence like it's like as a fighter, we go through all the, this process, these interviews. Like you almost have to like fake this like confidence and you have to tell yourself you're going to win the fight because you don't want to go into a fight thinking you're going to lose. So obviously I was confident going into the Calvin fight, but I didn't truly know I was capable. Like I didn't know I can, I can go five rounds. I, I didn't know I can push a pace. I didn't know I could have moments in that fight. Like I went back and watched the fight the other day. Like there was moments round one was super close. Like there was moments in that round one, like I could have won the round. Round two, I, I won the round. Round three, there was moments like round one where I could have won the round. I could have won the fight. But it, for me, it was just experience. I, I got 25 minutes of cage time with one of the best fighters in the world. And, and I've improved so much since then. So, like, I have nothing but confidence. I, I really, truly, I don't have to fake confidence anymore. I, I, I feel it. And I, I, I feel like I just carry myself differently. I walk, I think like a champion, I act like a champion. And I don't know, everything's just coming together and it's perfect timing. And these like, these losses, these experiences are, have, and the wins have created the man who I am today. Yeah, I mean, after that Calvin fight, you had a 22 second knockout over Gavin Tucker. I mean, so impressive, but yeah. also so perfect considering you had a pregnant wife at home. Yeah. You were able to be healthy when Bam was born, but when you take, you know, the Calvin fight and that Gavin Tucker fight into consideration, how does that propel you and prepare you for this fight against uh, the Korean Zombie, which is scheduled for 25 minutes? Yeah. So after the Calvin fight, I kind of really, for once, I, I had I had time. Like, I'm going to take some time to just don't schedule any fights. I'm going to just get better and work on my skill and technique and repetition, repetition, work on my precision, work on my accuracy and I, I literally improved everywhere and having that 22 second knockout, like I didn't, the good thing about it is I didn't show any of that. I just showed one punch and I feel like I have a lot more tools. Um, I'm just sharper, I'm better everywhere. And I, I didn't really show that, but I will get to show it, which is exciting against the Korean zombie. Um, and yeah, we have 25 minutes to work and 
I'm confident because I, I'm in the best shape I've ever been in. Like I've, I've had great notice going into this, this fight. Um, I'm in much better shape. I'm in like right now than when I fought Calvin Cater. So, and we still have a few weeks to go and I just, I feel, I feel amazing. I, I know I could push a pace for 25 minutes. I know I can, I have the ability to finish him everywhere, anywhere the fight goes. And it, it'll be good, especially him going, his last fight going to a decision with Brian Ortega, who's now fighting for the title. Like that motivates me too, like to go out there and put on a better performance and kind of establish myself and stamp myself into the, into the top five as a contender. So I have a lot of motivation going into this fight. If you had to pinpoint where you feel like you've grown the most and where you think it might benefit you the most in this matchup, what would it be? I've always been a well-rounded fighter. I've never been great at anything though. I've just been kind of good everywhere, but I, I just think my, my footwork and my, my vision and my sight and my angles and my, my ability to, to adapt is just by far the best. Um, I think that's what separates me, my mentality. It separates me from the rest of the division and I just, I don't know. I just do not see myself losing in any way or form. So I, I feel great and I, I really see myself getting a victory. What made you want this fight for so long? Because I mean, even before this fight was announced, you've been calling for it for quite a while, it yeah. seems. Yeah, I asked for it a few times and, and it's not a, in any way or form disrespectful because I, I respect the Korean Zombie so much. I think he's a, an amazing fighter. I've been watching him since I was in high school. Um, it's just one of those fights like like an opportunity to face a legend in a fighting style like his fighting style and my fighting style just makes for a great fight. Like it's going to put on it's going to be a great fight for the fans, great fight for the company, great fight for me, great fight for him too. Like it's it's a clash of styles that literally will, you know, create fireworks. And I don't know, it just has bonus, bonus <laughs> rain all over it. <laughs> Extra checks are always great, especially yeah. with another mouth to feed. But when you look at the matchup, and I'm sure you've envisioned it just dozens of times, I mean, what do you feel like is key to success in this one? I think it will, my, my ability to move and create angles and create openings to I'm always a guy that looks for the finish so like I think I'll be able to create those openings with the fact like Korean Zombie doesn't he's not a guy that's running that I have to chase that I have to find and like he will be there like I've watched every single one of his fights he's there and, and unless he's going to change in one fight like he's going to be there and he's going to be there to hit he's going to be there to wrestle he's going to be there to clinch like everything will be there and I just have to go out there and make it happen that's and it's easier said than done, but I, I, I'm fully prepared and confident. I'm, for me, if I'm in good shape, like I'm confident like, and I'm in the best shape ever. And that means I can go out there and have fun. I can put, I can put my foot on the gas and go out there and try things and not be afraid and take risk and, you know, make something happen. With this huge matchup with a brand new baby at home, does it make it easier? Do you feel like it's better that the fact that this is scheduled for Las Vegas, the city in which you reside? No, it's awesome. Um, just to fight at home in general is awesome. Like, not till my last fight, I, I've never got to really fight in Vegas besides the Contender Series. So, it, it's it's definitely nice. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I'll travel. I'll I'll fight. I'll fight on the moon. If they <laughs> told me you know, we're going to the moon, I'll fight there. I just to drive two exits away from my house and do all my training here. Like, yes, it feels home for me. Um, and I do have that home court advantage. Absolutely. So what does 2021, the rest of the year, what does it look like for Danny Gay? Oh, I see myself getting a big win June 19th and see myself getting a, a big fight at the end of the year in December, a big contender fight or you never know, maybe even a title fight, you never know. Um, obviously I'm focused on the Korean Zombie and that's it, but I, I do see past it and I do, I do look past it 
not in a disrespectful way, but I have a vision. I have a vision to become a champion. Zombies in my path. And I, I just see myself getting closer and closer to the belt. Well, Dan, we can't wait to watch the journey. Best of luck to you. Have fun in there. We will all be watching. Thank you so much. I'm super excited and I can't wait to go out there and put on a great show.